I'm celebrating Learning Curve's first birthday with a look at a guitar that I consider myself lucky to own. This is the story behind the recording king, Roy Smeck A104, this week on Learning Curve. Hi, I'm Spencer Dobson. I've been doing this show for one year now, and while it is clearly not a massive internet sensation, I'm having a ton of fun doing it, and I'm learning a lot in the process, so I'm going to call that a win. This week I want to talk about a very special guitar. Uh, it was made between 1937 and 1940. I'm not exactly sure when. Uh, it is the Recording King Roy Smeck A104. Now you've seen this guitar in the back of a bunch of my videos. It's right there. It's that one. Uh, so let's uh, let's dive in. So this guitar was given to me by a friend in the mid-90s, probably 96, 97. Uh, what happened was he found it in a pawn shop for 50 bucks. And if you look at the original list price, that's probably what it was selling for uh, when it was originally on the market. But he just had it hanging on the wall as a piece of art. Uh, the guy he bought it from clearly didn't know what it was or what it was worth. Uh, and my friend never played it. So I asked him if I could play it and I tuned it up. And the thing, it just sounds... Ugh, it's just got this great tone to it. It's got this feel to it. And like it feels like it's got a history. I don't know what the history is, but this thing just has vibes, right? And so I played it whenever I was over there. Well... He ends up moving, and he doesn't want to bring it with him, and he's like, look, somebody should play this. It's not supposed to hang on a wall. It's supposed to be played. So he gave it to me, and I've had it ever since. So this guitar, again, it just, it's got so much feel. You can, like, history is dripping out of it. Because of the, because of the wear and tear on it when I got it, it just seemed like, it had been through a lot, a lot of jams, a lot of music, and a lot of life. But let's start with the history. So first off, who's Recording King? Well, Recording King was the name Gibson used when it wanted to sell guitars out of the Montgomery Ward catalog without putting the Gibson name on it. It's kind of like how Fender has Squire and how, uh, you know, uh, Gibson has Epiphone today. And Gibson sold guitars, ukuleles, banjos, lab steels, all those things out of Montgomery Ward. And they all went under the name either Recording King or Studio King. Now other companies like K, Martin, and Regal, they all sold stuff out of the Montgomery Wards catalog as well, but they went under their own names. By the way, if you're super young and you don't know what a catalog was, before there was Amazon, stores like Montgomery Wards, which used to be a brick and mortar store, would send you this catalog full of pants and kitchen appliances and uh, sometimes musical instruments. And that's where you would find these Recording King guitars. Now, from my understanding of Gibson at the time, and I'm basing this on The Birth of Loud, which if you haven't read, you should really check out. It's a great book if you're interested in the history of, of uh, guitars. Uh, at the time, Gibson really prided itself on its connection to old world luthiers, on, on tradition, on prestige. You know, these are, these are luthiers whose line lineages date back to like the 1600s. So... They don't make instruments that you sell in some crappy mail order catalog for the peasants. These are high end classy instruments that are that are for professional musicians, uh, from my understanding. So that's why they maybe wanted to separate themselves out and create this other brand that would, you know, that they could sell without uh, besmirching their good name, as it were. Now, ironically, in 1935, a full 12% of Gibson sales were going out through the Montgomery Ward catalog. In fact, Montgomery Ward was responsible for the sales equaling the next four largest sellers of Gibson guitars combined. 
a lot of articles, specifically the one I've put in the description, credit Montgomery Ward for keeping Gibson afloat through the Depression so that they could go on and make the instruments that they're famous for, specifically the Les Paul, the Flying V, the Explorer, the SG, etc., etc., etc. So no Montgomery Ward, none of that stuff happens. Okay, here's another interesting point, and I feel like this jibes with the attitudes that they expressed in this book and what I've seen through my other readings through this is that Gibson didn't want to put the neck pickup in the guitar, okay? They had succeeded in making a, a guitar pickup in, in, in a lab steel called the Pan, but they never really figured out how to make a pickup work in an electric, what they would call a Spanish guitar, what you and I would just call a guitar. However, pressure from people like Montgomery Warden Spiegel, who was another marketer at the time, or who was another catalog at the time, kind of forced Gibson's hand, and they went, fine, we'll put the pickup in the neck. Uh, and they did, and it sold. And then, like, right after that, Gibson came out with the Gibson ES-150, which is the first electric guitar with Gibson's name on it, okay? And some would argue the first electric guitar, but just before that, Montgomery Wards had the 1270, which is a Gibson, you know, like it's like a cheap Gibson with a neck pickup in it. So technically the first Gibson electric guitar, if this research is right, was actually sold through Montgomery Wards catalog. And shortly thereafter, Gibson realized they might be onto something and they released the ES-150 ES stands for Electric Spanish. Some of you knew that, but some of you didn't. So how this all ties together is this Roy Smek A104 is the cheap version of the ES150, which is an expensive copy of the Montgomery Ward 1270. <coughs> so it's a knockoff of a knockoff. Now, the Gibson ES-150 is the Charlie Christian guitar, and I'll talk more about him in a minute, but you may have heard of a Charlie Christian pickup. That's that neck pickup, except on the Gibson models, it's got a hexagon shape to it. These are round. The other main difference between the, the Roy Smek and the Gibson is that the Gibson's got a truss rod in it because... Uh, that was considered a real high-end feature, and it was a new innovation at the time, and Gibson reserved it for its high-end model. So apparently they cut some corners on the Roy Smek and Montgomery Ward stuff, but, but that's by 1930s, 1940s standards of cutting corners, which means this guitar, which is almost 100 years old now, is only going to last like 10 million years instead of a billion so as far as I can tell, the ES-150 is the first electric guitar with Gibson's name on it. And it shipped in 1936. So by 1937, it looks like Montgomery Wards felt that they needed to put a name on the 1270 to kind of boost its profile a little bit. But who were they going to get? Well, they already had a guy, and his name was on ukuleles, and banjos, and guitars, and lap steels, so why not him? His nickname was the Wizard of Strings, and his name was Roy Smek. There's been a video going around the web since the passing of the great Eddie Van Halen, and the, the video is called uh, Van Halen's Father, and it's a, it's a really old film. Uh, it was probably shot late 30s, early 40s. Uh, and it's this guy playing a ukulele, right? And in the middle of the performance, and he's an amazing ukulele player, but then in the middle of it, he starts tapping on the fretboard. Now, it's not exactly like Eruption, but it is definitely a precursor to Eruption. That guy is Roy Smek. Now, Roy Smek was a vaudeville multi-instrumentalist. Uh, I, I attached a documentary in the description because it's, he's really worth looking into. He's a pretty incredible guy, right? And he's really funny, and he seems pretty, he's really charming. Now, there are people that say the only reason that Roy Smek isn't put on a pedestal like some of the greats, like your Charlie Parkers, your Dizzy Gillespie's, is because his main axe was a ukulele. 
and he was a bit of a novelty act, but he was a brilliant novelty act, right? So there's stories of him not only tapping like Eddie Van Halen, but playing behind his head and duck walking like Chuck Berry and playing with his teeth like Jimi Hendrix. Now, I found videos of him doing some amazing stuff. So I can confirm some of these things. Some of these might just be, you know, stories that people like to tell. It's kind of hard to say, but if you look at what he did do, it's already impressive enough. Uh, there's a video where he starts blowing in the sound hole for percussion. He beats on the thing rhythmically. He really just, again, plays the living crap out of the ukulele. And mind you, he was doing that when he was on his best behavior. Film was precious at the time. It's not like now where you can just turn on a camera and let it roll. You got to do your best stuff right there. I would like to see the stuff he did on the vaudeville stage for The Late Show. You know, I bet some of that is pretty out of this world. Now, again, I can't prove that he played with his teeth, uh, but I have no problem believing it. Uh, you know, he came from vaudeville, and vaudeville people had chops, like serious chops. There's a book called Comedians, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy that talks about what it was like to be a vaudeville performer at the time, the impact vaudeville had on American culture, and just what these people went through. And... Uh, there's a clip in that documentary that I talked about earlier where Roy is talking about how he paid his dues being a vaudeville performer and then they invent something called television and people could just go on TV and be famous instantly. Psh, what a bunch of crap. And he sounds exactly like road comics now talking about Twitter celebrities and YouTube stars and Instagram stars. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So, back on track. Montgomery Wards needs a celebrity name to put on their ES, or Electric Spanish model, and Roy Smeck is a celebrity at the time. He is, he is the guitar guy. He is the Van Halen of his day, for sure, right? He's Tosin Abasi, Eddie Van Halen, and Steve Vai all wrapped into one if it's the 30s. So, of course, Montgomery Wards asks Roy, and Roy says yes! Look, his name's already on a banjo, a ukulele, uh, a, a lap steel. So Roy Smeck already has a deal with Gibson. He, they, Gibson made a signature model called the Roy Smeck Stage Deluxe. They released it from 1934 to 1942. So a little history on the ES-150. Uh, before the ES-150, the guitar was a rhythm instrument, okay? It just it couldn't cut through the band. But... Once Gibson put that pickup in the neck, apparently at the urging of Montgomery Ward, you could play a single note lead because you had a pickup that was going through an amplifier that you could turn up, right? So suddenly the guitar is brought from the back of the stage to the front of the stage and you can do a guitar solo. So the guy that gets credit for grabbing the horns on this one it's a guy named Charlie Christian. I talked about him earlier. Now, there was probably, once you could plug the amp, plug your guitar into an amp, a lot of guys probably started doing single note solos. But the guy you heard do it first was a guy named Charlie Christian. Now, the reason you heard Charlie Christian do single note solos was because Charlie Christian was in the Benny Goodman sextet from 1939 to 1941. Now, in the late 30s, early 40s, Benny Goodman was the man. Charlie Christian wouldn't break until around 1939. Okay, that's when people heard him. And he broke using a guitar that looks an awful lot like this one. It was the high-end version of this guitar, specifically. And Charlie Christian inspired anybody who has ever played a single-note guitar solo, whether they know it or not. So I was wondering... Since it doesn't look like Roy Smeck actually played this guitar, this important, influential guitar, why is his name on it in the first place? And I realized that's because I'm looking at it from 2020's perspective, okay? In 1936, Gibson didn't know there was going to be a Charlie Christian, much less a Chuck Berry, much less a B.B. King, much less a Jimi Hendrix or an Eric Clapton. They didn't know there was going to be a rock and roll. They didn't know 
anything about what was about to happen. To them, this pickup was probably just a goofy gimmick that would probably go away and they needed to sell more guitars. So they probably had a conversation that went something kind of like this. Hey fellas, we need to sell some more guitars. Maybe put the name of a popular guitar player on these 1270s. We'll move some more units. Who's a popular guitar player? How about Roy Smeck? Do people know or care what kind of guitar he plays? And is the whole idea of an electric Spanish guitar a novelty that will probably go away real soon? Sure seems like it. Then let's give Roy some money and put his name on this silly guitar. And here it is. I want to point out again, this guitar is the knockoff version of the nice guitar. It's almost a hundred years old and it's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at my guitar, right? Okay, first of all, let's take a look at the neck. This has got a V-shaped neck. Now, I know sometimes with like a C or a D, you're like, is it a C or is it a D? I can't tell. This is a V. This is so for sure a V. Uh, it's got a 12-inch radius. This thing is a telephone pole. Like I said earlier, this was made before they started putting truss rods and everything. So this is meant to be sturdy. It's meant to hold up. And it's meant to balance against like 13s or 14s or 12s. Like really heavy strings are what you're supposed to put on this guy. I went on the light end of heavy uh, because I read that because of the way it's designed, um, it needs that balance of the, of the pull of the strings against the thing. So I hope that was good information. Now if you look at the back of the neck, I believe originally... The middle of the neck was a little bit lighter than the rest of the neck. But as you can see, the finish on this guitar has been played off, right? Again, I don't know the backstory on this guitar, but when you put the neck in your hand, it's got ghosts in it, man. So this is the original pickup, which means this is one of the original pickups. It's in the first, you know couple hundred thousand pickups made probably because I don't think they made that many of these guitars in the first place so uh, I had a friend who owns a guitar shop in Minneapolis and he looked at it and it's functional um, although right now I, I just plugged it in the other day and I could not get noise to come out of it I'm sure if I wanted to, to screw around I could probably reconnect the solders and stuff but the F holes make everything really difficult to get to and I do not want to help in the deterioration any more than I already have so we are going to accept the fact that this guitar is currently not able to be played electrically and again I could pop out the pickup pop out the controls put in new stuff but it's history and it just doesn't seem appropriate so the volume and tone knobs are original and if you look right here by the volume there's this little trail like this little worn out rut which leads me to believe this was owned by a serious player right you don't get that kind of a rut you know sitting in a corner you know somebody put some work into that uh, and also just the shape of these knobs the design of these knobs is really fantastic I have uh, no reason to believe that these aren't the original tuning pegs. They certainly look like the original tuning pegs. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think those are the real deal. Now, the pick guard isn't original. I don't know what happened to the original pick guard. In fact, I think when I got it, it didn't have a pick guard, and the person I took it to put this one on it. So that is the only non-original part. The tailpiece is original. The bridge is original. Uh, there used to be a strap button right there, but that was gone when I got my hands on it. I have no idea what happened to it. So this guitar was pretty scratched up when I got it. Unfortunately, I am responsible for some of these scratches just because life happens. And this guitar has been used. It's been hanging around my apartment and being played as an instrument uh, a lot. And uh, things just happen. I'm not proud that there's a couple of scratches on there for me but that's what happened i'm sorry so i love the f holes on this thing and i had never seen an acoustic guitars with f holes in it before i came into possession of this guitar i might have seen them and it didn't register but this is the first time i remember like seeing f holes on a guitar and being like oh my god that's such a cool way to do that 
But because of this episode, I did a little research on it, and it turns out they don't just look cool. So it turns out the F-hole provides the most powerful acoustic sound when it comes to a hollow body acoustic instrument. It has twice the sonic power of a regular round hole, and I'm not making that up. I've attached a documentary uh, that shows where I got that information from, and it's kind of mind-boggling. So, from what I understand, the F-hole was kind of created by mistake. Basically, different luthiers were copying each other, and um, this is kind of the shape that they landed on. But, they might have been on to something. It gives the, the instrument the ability to vibrate at different frequencies when it's played, um, it's really hard for me to illustrate this, but basically the wood is is moving and the different parts of the hole accentuate different parts of the sound wave. So you kind of get a woofer and a tweeter. And that's crazy, right? One more quick point. Science has tried to make a better F-hole. They've used lasers and robots and all kinds of stuff, but it turns out they just can't. Stradivarius and his boys knew what they were doing or stumbled upon the right combination and stuck with it, but that's incredible, right? So I have a question though. If this is acoustically the loudest guitar in their lineup, why did they feel the need to put a pickup in it? And my guess is it's because they were throwing some dookie at the wall and they wanted to see what would stick. So it's entirely possible that the innovation that launched m countless genres of music, that brought the guitar to the forefront of popular culture, that changed the lives of millions of people, happened because, you know, give it a shot. I love that. So, so this guitar has been with me through some of the hardest times of my life and some of the greatest times of my life. Uh, and I have played the blues on this guitar when I have had the blues, right? Now, I'm not saying I'm a great player. I might never be a great player. But like a lot of you, I don't play guitar to impress people. I play guitar because I love playing guitar. Now, doing this episode... I love this guitar even more because now I know more about its history and where the place it holds in guitar lore, you know? And like, that's really super exciting for me. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And I hope uh, you're enjoying Learning Curve and I hope uh, we can keep doing this because I'm having a lot of fun. It's been a really cool year. I've learned so much and I hope to continue uh, learning more. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, please share, please like, click the little bell, do all that crap. If you've watched any of these, if you've watched all of these, thank you so much. It means the world to me. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your interactions. Thank you for your support. I'm having a blast. My name's Spencer Dobson. This is Learning Curve. We'll see you next time.